Today on Applied Science, I want to talk about glass, uh, why it breaks and how we can strengthen it with a chemical process. So to get started, let me show you this rig that I built to uh, test the strength of these glass samples. Here we have a rigid aluminum frame with two fixed aluminum bars on the bottom and a pneumatic cylinder on the top, and the cylinder is connected to this bar here. So when I add pressure to the cylinder, it pushes down on this middle bar and puts the piece of glass, which is a microscope slide, in bending. And eventually when there's enough force being generated by the cylinder, it snaps the slide. I can control the pressure very carefully by dialing up the regulator here, and the gauge here and here will show the pressure in the system. All right, so let's give it a go. Okay, so that held about 24 PSI uh, before breaking. So I'll unload the pressure here, clean out the glass, and I'll wipe off the surfaces there to make sure that there's as little glass grit as possible. And now I'll try one of the microscope slides that I treated with the chemical process, which I'll talk about in a minute. Okay, so that one broke at about 60 to 70 PSI, so the process really increases the strength quite a bit. Let's talk about what's actually going on here. When we bend one of the microscope slides in this test unit, what's actually happening is the top of the slide is in compression. You can see the lines move closer together here, and the bottom of the slide is in tension. Now, Glass, like most brittle materials, can handle the compression just fine. It's actually the tension that's a big problem. And the reason is that all pieces of glass in the world have microscopic defects in them, uh, tiny little cracks. And when we bend the piece like this, those little cracks propagate because they're being pulled apart by these tension forces. Let me show you with a piece of packing tape. If I pull on the tape like this, you know, I can feel it stretching a bit, but it's certainly not breaking. It's, it's quite strong. However, if I introduce a defect just by slicing it a little bit with a pair of scissors so that there's a, a cut in it now, you can see the defect, and then I just pull on it, there's no strength at all. And you could say, yeah, but the material strength, the plastic of the tape is still as strong as it always was. I just added that defect. But remember, in materials like glass, there are a huge number of defects in all pieces of glass that you'll encounter in the world. They're distributed throughout the material. So it's actually the size and the number of the defects that determine how strong a piece of glass is. If we could somehow make a piece of glass that truly had no defects whatsoever, it would be about a hundred times stronger or more than most glass that we encounter in the world. So if we want to make a piece of glass stronger, what can we do? As it turns out, with current technology, for a given size of, of glass, we actually can't reduce the number of defects. We can treat them almost as a material property. The defects in the glass are one and the same. So what else can we do? Well, we identified that compression is easy for glass to handle, but tension is a problem because it pulls open those, those defects and causes a, a failure. So if we could somehow eliminate the tension force, then we could effectively make the material stronger. And there's a clever way to do this with a chemical process. Most common pieces of glass in the world have had sodium added to it to lower its melting temperature. So pure silicon dioxide is uh, great, but it melts at such a high temperature it's difficult to work with. So we add sodium oxide in addition to lots of other things to lower the melting temperature. So here's a, a diagram of what that might look like. This is a slab of glass here and the small circles inside are sodium atoms. And this chemical trick involves submerging the piece of glass in pot a potassium salt. So these larger circles are potassium atoms. And through the natural process of diffusion, some of the potassium atoms will take the place of the sodium atoms in the piece of glass. So what's happening here is these larger potassium atoms are being shoved into the spaces where there used to be just a very small sodium atom. And the effect is that we've basically shoved the glass 
put the glass in compression by jamming these larger atoms inside of it. Now this process happens at a temperature lower than the glass softening point. So the glass is still hard when this is happening. And as we're shoving in these larger atoms, the glass is becoming increasingly uh, put into compression. However, the center of the glass is not affected by this process uh, as quickly because this is like a diffusion process. And so it takes a while for these potassium atoms to work their way into the glass. So if we cancel the process after a certain amount of time, the center of the glass will not have this effect at all and the edges will, um, will be in compression. So after the treatment, what we have is something like this, where the edges of the piece of glass are in compression and the center of the glass is actually in tension because of all those extra atoms that we jammed in around the periphery. And this is true around the edges too, but I'm just showing it in one direction. So later when we load the piece in bending, the top gets to be uh, even higher in compression uh, the center is still in tension, but the bottom layer, which would normally be in tension in a bending situation like this, is now either neutral or at least it's offset quite a bit uh, because of that residual compression is sort of canceling out the tension that would be created by this loading scenario. So we've effectively strengthened the piece of glass by pre-loading it in compression. We were able to get rid of some of that tension loading. Another way to think about this is that the compression that we've added to this edge of the glass helps close the cracks. So when we put this in bending, this crack here, the defect doesn't shoot up through the glass and cause breakage because we're in compression here and it's actually sealing the cracks shut. The process is pretty straightforward. I set up a stainless steel container in a small kiln and added to it some potassium nitrate that I bought on eBay. I leaned the glass microscope slides against the stainless container and then turned the kiln on and set it to about 425 degrees centigrade. After the kiln came up to temperature, I opened it up and noticed that the potassium nitrate had quite a few impurities floating on the surface, so I fished those off and then added the slides to the now molten potassium nitrate. Since the process was going pretty well, I also upped the temperature to 450 degrees. After three hours at that temperature, I fished the slides out and let them cool as slowly as possible, but I didn't do anything special like put them into a temperature controlled chamber. I just put them out in air. After they cooled down naturally, I washed the slides off in tap water and then loaded them into the test rig and tested their strength. So did we just make Gorilla Glass? No, not quite. Actually, Gorilla Glass is a proprietary blend of ingredients. It's actually the starting point of the glass. The uh, chemical strengthening that I've described in this video has long been um, out of patent protection and lots of people do it. Uh, the special thing about Gorilla Glass is that it has a very unique set of ingredients that make it especially amenable to this um, chemical strengthening process. Okay, see you next time. Bye.